No black cats, just straight facts. Triple P certified. Listen, we can talk about odds all day. It doesn't matter what the odds are. It matters what's gonna happen. Welcome to the Perfect Parlay Pursuit. We are here once again to break down another UFC event, Pursuing the Perfect Parlay. Alex, Dan, the Batman are here with me, and we have a very special guest joining us at the top of the hour. It is the one and only, the king of journalism, the king of interviews when it comes to mixed martial arts. It is the James Lynch. He will be joining us on the show to break down the weigh-ins for UFC Vegas 32, TJ Dillashaw versus Corey Sanhagen. Alex, Dan, how are you guys doing today? I'm down bad. I'm down very bad right now. I just I just made the the venture back from Atlantic City, New Jersey. I was at the casino all night long. Didn't get to bed till about six thirty a.m. But guess what? I'm here. I watched the weigh-ins and I'm ready to roll. Yeah. So you're down bad, money wise or brain cell wise or both? Uh, brain cell wise, I, I came out up, not as up as I was at one point, but you know, I, I still didn't lose any money. I came out on top and made a couple of poor purchases from some sketchier people on the boardwalk. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I've bought a couple of four locos, uh, you know, uh, they were custom made bootleg four locos, but we won't get into any sort of tall tales from the adventures of Atlantic city. Uh, today. Dan, how are you doing? I'll bring this podcast back to a more wholesome level. Last night, I went to a baseball game, the All-American ball game, and uh, enjoyed myself. And I'm looking forward to one of the best non-pay-per-view cards of the year. I think we've got some good, uh, some good bets for you here. So looking forward to it. Yeah, as you guys know, we have the snake taking on the mongoose. Uh, and, you know, we've made our opinions very clear. Alex and Dan going into this weigh-in. We're backing TJ Dillashaw, the underdog, coming off a two-year layoff due to a suspension for use of EPO. Now, um, we got we got to be an event, boys. The boys just weighed in. I watched the whole weigh-ins. I watched the whole face-offs. Uh, they literally just ended fresh off the presses. So we're going to break down the whole weigh-ins uh, as we saw them. We got James Lynch joining us in about five minutes, and we're also going to do a little talking tough. So before James joins us, Alex, before we get into the weigh-ins, you watched this most recent episode of The Ultimate Fighter. Am I am I correct in assuming that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, and you're, you're going to love this, man, because this episode is probably the best one all season, right? For all the wrong reasons. So what happens is this. There is a fighter on the card. Alex, what was his name? The guy who uh, injured his NCL. Uh, I don't know. Based from Las Vegas. Okay. Well, either way, no one ever should remember his name because Dan, he goes and sees the UFC doctor because he throws a kick and hurts his knee. Right. And the guy's like, well, it's a partial tear, but I mean, you know, if you can bear the pain, you can fight, but it's not fully torn. I mean, could you make it worse? Yes. But you know, it's going to be up to you. Like you got to figure it out. And he's just like, well, you know, health is wealth. I got to preserve my health in this sport. It's like, dude, in this sport, Alex, at this point, I'm like, in this sport, you're not in this sport yet, brother. You ain't <laughs> like you're not some fresh out of college basketball player on a on a contract with no guarantee. You need to nurse this thing, baby. You're in the ultimate fighter house on the first fight of your your tenure on this season. You need to get in there and fight no matter what. Um, and he's just you can tell, man, he's breaking mentally, he's looking for a way out. He's like, Well, I gotta go get it checked out. And you can tell like the coaching staff, Henry Gracie, Ortega, they're trying to like tap dance around it because they don't want to get filmed on camera encouraging some guy to fight her. A guy that, you know, in all fairness, they don't really know. It's not like Henry talking to Ortega, who's known since he's 13 years old, where he can be like, dude, come on, this is your opportunity. This is your They don't know this guy, you know. They, he, he could then turn around and be like, yeah, like, like it's, it's some frat hazing thing. He could be like, these guys encouraged me to do something I didn't want to do. I was under pressure. I was under the, you know, the bright lights of Hollywood. So anyway, Alex, I would love to get your thoughts on this. I watched that, uh, that whole play out that little drama play out and i was looking at my girlfriend i'm like this guy doesn't want to fight i'm like he wants to get he wants out and uh, it, was, it was a sad display yeah there was uh some big drama show uh on on tough this week for sure i mean in one aspect if you know you're gonna go out there and lose regardless because your knee is that hurt um you shouldn't fight because you're gonna get another opportunity one way or another but if you go out there and get your ass kicked, 
you don't necessarily know if you're going to be the guy who gets called up during the Ultimate Fighter finale to get a get a bout. So, I mean, in one aspect, it's kind of smart, but in the other aspect, it's kind of dumb because the doctor's telling you you can fight, and Dana White's obviously going to hear about this, and he doesn't like pull-out merchants. So, like, it kind of shoots yourself in the foot in a way. And now this other guy who got his ass kicked in 30 seconds is Dana White's new favorite fighter. The guy quit his job to be a replacement on the Ultimate Fighter, spent two months away from his family after, on his own dime, after he was already not taken to be on the Ultimate Fighter. He was like, all right, well, if anybody falls out, I'm next up. He still lost in 10 seconds, but I almost guarantee that guy fights on the Ultimate Fighter finale because he came in on four, three days notice and then still fought, left his family, on his own money, you know, that's that's hard right there. Quit his freaking job, man. He had and benefits, a salary, and everything. And he was saying that. And Dana White's like, I get goosebumps. This is the st- type of stuff that I live for. These are the stories that I love. It, it sucks that it didn't work out for him. It would have been awesome if he went out there and knocked the guy out. I'm very happy for Gilbert Urbina, the first Urbina to win a fight on the Ultimate Fighter house. So, yeah, that's yeah, different. Third generation. Third generation tough member him his brother and his other brother all on tough his one brother was on the contender series as well you know his only loss luke tell me sean brady sean brady wow yeah because they were doing you know they said at the beginning they were like well he'll get the first win on the ultimate fighter for his family and i was like oh, that was a weird way of saying it like yeah it's for his family but i mean but then they mentioned no both of his older brothers were on different seasons of the ultimate fighter and went one and done lost and this is his chance to kind of get that uh get that one back he did get it back and dan like alex mentioned the guy he fought dana white brought in they had basically told this guy don't really get your hopes up you're not going to get brought in as a replacement but if you want to hang around we will pick you as an alternate if we need you so this guy quits his job because they wouldn't give him the time off stays in las vegas and just waits around ends up getting the call Dana White brings him in, asks him, he goes, so they told me you quit your job. They told me, you, he's like, yeah, full benefits, health insurance, everything, 40 hours salary. I, I quit it. I got a family. You know, I stayed here just for the opportunity. So he stayed. They bring him back on. He loses, obviously. But Alex, you know, it, it is ballsy. It is cool that he stayed, but he is, you know, 34 years old. I was Once I heard that, I was like, and then, you know, Henry Gracie is explaining him very basic jujitsu defense. I'm like, what made this guy have the confidence to think that he could sell out down the river all you know at 34 years old? This is his last chance to quit. I mean, maybe keep that job, man, because even if you have the best UFC career ever, you're only guaranteed like a few more years, to, you know, and like you're a little bit behind. So, Dude, all right, that's well, exactly what I was thinking. I was like, 34, man, like, and you're from Michigan? Yes, dude. I, I, I mean, you was- <laughs> leave Michigan. Hey, man, just chasing down the dream. That's what the show is all about, right? I mean, he could probably parlay this into something else, uh, some sort of UFC commentary, kind of like what we're doing. You know, he's probably a huge fan favorite as far as the tough audience goes, so good for him. He's, he's listen, it's not going to be a long career, obviously, with him being 34 and obviously not being all that great, but he's just looking for that one, that one time in the octagon. Just that one time, baby. That's what sports is all about. And I mean, he's certainly going to get it after you wow Dana White with your story. And, you know, even though you didn't win the fight, you know, you got the heart to stay there, quit your job. And, you know what I mean? Get your ass kicked in 30 seconds on three days notice. You know, Dana White loves guys like that. So it, it, it was great to see. I think both guys are going to have a great, uh, great career. And on top of that, dude, uh, we're in the semifinals of Ultimate Fighter, and I couldn't be more excited. Not a lot of drama in the coaches' debate on who exactly is going to get which fighters to fight who. Very respectful, which is weird, especially based on how everything went with Ortega and Volkanovski, even in all that aftermath of the guy falling out. Like, Volkanovski was like, yeah, what are you guys giggling over there for? This guy just lost his whole dream right here now Ooh. and um sorry i spit all over my screen i i'm down bad <laughs> fellas i'm down so bad yes dude and it's fine usually we would spend a lot more time breaking down each week's episode of the ultimate fighter on today's after the weigh-in show but today we have a very special guest as i mentioned and he is here now 
So without further ado, let us welcome to the stream the one and only James Lynch from Lynch on Sports. James, thank you so much for joining us. Sorry to keep you waiting a little bit there. Had to wrap a bow on that tough talk as we do each Friday. Uh, do you watch Ultimate Fighter? I PVR it. I'm going to catch up at the end of the season and get all the fights in. I, I got too much on my plate these days uh, to actually sit and you know watch the reality side of it. But uh, yeah, it's, it's on the list of things to do before the finale is uh, I just got to catch up on it. But uh, yeah, I was hearing your talk. It sounds pretty interesting from what you guys were saying. Yeah, great episode that we just had. Um, so yeah, boys, uh, James Lynch is here. Why don't you say hello? Um, Welcome guys. back, James. Always glad to have your insight and your knowledge. Love it, buddy. Great to yeah, have Thanks you. for having me on, guys. Yeah, so we just watched the weigh-ins. Um, usually we reserve this show to do a little after the weigh-ins chat combined with now that the Ultimate Fighter is kicking off. We talk about each episode of that. And I will say it's definitely worth a watch, James. If you've seen past seasons, it's much better than any of the other seasons, I think, in terms of from your perspective as a sports fan, you enjoy watching the actual events. So you're going to get a lot of like behind the scenes training stuff, a lot less drama and a lot more, a lot more meat and a lot less potatoes. If you know what I mean? Yeah, no, for sure. I, I, it's definitely something I wanted. There's a bunch of fighters. I know they're already Vince Murdoch. I've followed for years. Brady Halstead. I actually called one of his fights. Uh, he, he fought up here in Canada. So I was doing commentary for his fight against Chad and Helliger and uh, Mitch Raposo, plenty of interviews with that guy before he made it onto the ultimate fighter as well. So there's a lot of names on there that I've been kind of keeping tabs on, but uh, I, I'm just one of those guys where just, you know, Tuesday nights tough. I got other stuff going on. So I'll, I'll PVR it all and then sort of catch up at the end. But uh, yeah, it'll be like kind of one of those marathon days. I'll be uh, putting all the work in. Totally, totally. So did you catch the weigh-ins and the face-off? They did, just, yeah. So I think we synced this up perfectly. I don't know that we could have uh, had it another minute later. They just got done. So any any key takeaways? I mean, we can start right at the bottom of the card and go up, um, unless you have something that really stood out that you want to address first. Well, it's kind of near the bottom of the card. So Jara Eubanks, I was really surprised that she made 125. I thought this was a bad move for her. Um, I figured she would make the weight because I think for this, you know, for her, let's be honest here, it's kind of do or die in the sense that she's lost a couple fights now looking to, you know, have more success at 125. I really like this matchup against Elise Reed. Elise Reed uh, is someone who, you know, should really be a straw weight. Um, you know, she's someone that, uh, you know, actually fought another Canadian that I know, Jasmine Jadzavidius, got a win there. Um, this looks like a clear cut win for Sajara. And the big thing I was looking for was her making weight i thought she looked great in that one um other than that you know tj dillashaw looked great there was some weird rumor going on on twitter about dillashaw having a foot issue which is why you never trust twitter unless someone's got that blue check mark uh, next to their name when it comes to uh, rumors and that you know some people saying he had a foot injury he looked fine on the weigh-ins um nothing really like stood out the one that like i said i was looking for, looking for two actually so jar eubanks who you know hasn't fought at 125 in a while and julio arce here's a guy that hasn't fought at bantamweight since 2016 when he fought get this brian kelleher at ring of combat that. So this was back on the regional scene. So I was curious if, you know, Julio was going to make the weight look like he made it with no issues. So those were kind of the big ones I was looking at because pretty much everyone else on this card, they're, they're people that don't usually typically miss weight. Yeah, I've actually been to a Ring of Combat event in Atlantic City, I think. That's a New Jersey-based promotion, right? Yep, you bet. A lot of uh, UFC level talent or a lot of fighters from that promotion went to the UFC. Chris Weidman, Uriah Hall, uh, Kelleher, Arce. I mean, the list goes on. Just a really, really, really solid promotion. And you mentioned Sajara Eubanks. Uh, that was a fight where I, you know, I'm I'm not by any means, guys, a Sajara Eubanks um, bandwagoner or a supporter necessarily of betting on her. Uh, I think that she's hit or miss a lot of times. You know, it seems that sometimes she'll overperform in certain situations. For example, Julia Avila. I really thought that was Julia's fight to win. Sajara Sarge comes out there, looks like a world beater. And then in other fights, uh, it comes to mind where you think it's you know a good fight for Sarge Sajara. She ends up dropping it. So I, I don't like betting on Sajara Eubanks. I mean, she's got Lloyd Irving, she's got Mark Henry, she's got some of these amazing coaches, right? And it's like, I really uh, am afraid to kind of pick that. But when I saw her opponent was undefeated, I was like, ooh, could this be an opportunity to face Sajara? But she did come in looking great on the scale. I saw the face-offs, they sized up. The advantage was clear for Eubanks. I mean, she should have no problem. This is her fight to lose, really. She's deservingly the biggest favorite on the card, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, she's what? I'm, I'm just looking now at a lot of the lines. Uh, she's, yeah, like minus 360. I'm seeing on a lot of books. That is, yeah, that is the biggest favorite on here. Yeah. Weirdly enough, though, if you go to um, some of the polls that I've seen, um, they have it a little bit closer. Like I've seen some just polls from random like fan accounts on Instagram where people see, you know, they throw up a little poll like Sajar reads, and people are just like, I'm seeing some over 50% 
polls leaning towards Reed. So I don't know what some people might know. Maybe not Dan. Did you it's get probably a fade on Sajara, if anything, because she has been very inconsistent. I understand the, the critics on that, by the way. Like, I mean, you, you nailed it on the head there. I also picked Avil in that fight. Like there's certain fights where she just she looks really good. And then there's certain fights where it's like, how did you lose that? So I think it's more a fade on here. You also got to factor in the age, right? She's getting up there. Um, the, the record overall is not great. Uh, she's what, you know, barely 500 or is 500 right now. Elise is undefeated. So there's some thought of, oh, this newcomer coming in, you know, can't she take care of business? But I'll be honest, I'm a little surprised that Reed got signed out, right? Because she's only got four fights. That's typically the type of fighter you'd see on Contender Series, not necessarily getting a, a UFC call. So we'll see. Maybe I'm wrong about this one, but this was one of the fights I looked at thinking, okay, this is very favorable for Sajara. And one other thing I'll add in here, which is kind of true in a lot of cases, She's part of Dominance MMA, their management, Ali Abdelaziz. They get a lot of favorable matchups for their fighters in certain situations. This is one of them, I think. Reminds me of when Cody Garbrandt fought a Sun Sao. I mean, that was clearly an advantage there for Garbrandt. Garbrandt needed a bounce back fight. He fought a guy who's clearly on the decline in a Sun Sao. This looks like the same thing here with Sajara. They're going to give this newcomer a chance. It'll be one of those situations, in my view, of how I think the fight playing out. Sajara will get a dominant performance, but Elise Reed will look good, and we'll talk about how much better she'll look at 115 the next fight. That's my prediction. That's how I think the fight's going to go. Awesome. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I'm getting a little lag here. I just closed oh, no the tabs. Still getting used to StreamYard. So, uh, Dan, Alex, anything you want to say about you know the first couple opening fights on the way? We can kind of move past the Sajara fight unless you have any hot takes you want to throw out there. But um, yeah, just moving right up from the bottom of the card. I think there's plenty of other better underdogs to take than Reed right now. I think that's a dangerous fight. You know, four and zero is great, and especially compared to six and six. But at least with six and six, we have data on Sajara Eubanks. Reed, not enough data yet. So moving along, I think there are some better underdogs to sniff out. But what did you guys think about the first fight? Because Hannah Goldie is certainly going to have a height and reach disadvantage going in against Balbita. But when I saw him face off, I wasn't I, I, I wasn't afraid to pick Goldie. I still think that maybe Goldie is going to just have the better ring IQ, more to lose, more to gain, hungrier, coming off a long layoff. And after seeing your interview with her, James, that really turned me around with Goldie because I was like, just the spirit of somebody who has three jobs to pursue MMA, right? An already very hard thing. I mean, I know girls that don't want one job and definitely don't want a cage fight, but to, for a woman to have three jobs so she can cage fight and then have the government essentially take all three jobs away from her during the lockdowns and the pandemic to then pursue only fans. I mean, it's like she's going to be fighting with a weight vest taken off, it seems. She's going to have a lot less stresses in her life, both financial, both um, interpersonal. And to me, going into that, going into a fight with that kind of break, is going to be, you know, a very head clearing space to enter competition. And what do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, but you know the old expression: it's it's hard uh, to get up and run when you're busy taking pictures of your feet. You know? <laughs> I don't think I've heard that one, but yeah. <laughs> Good work. Uh, Damn. That's a great it's a great like psychological breakdown. I haven't really thought of it like that, but I think that definitely adds some credence to this fight. And just looking at it from you know the physicality standpoint, you know, to say what you want about Hannah Goldie, but she's always going to go in there super in shape, really strong, and that's what I took away from this particular way. And against uh, Deanna Belbita, just looked a little bit undersized as far as just pure strength goes. So that could play out um, at some point in the fight. And we'll see. I mean, it's one of those fights that I'm definitely shying away from, from a, a better perspective. But that's really just what stuck out to me uh, in that particular way. And, and the main thing I'm upset about is now I'm going to have to actually buy her OnlyFans because I did miss her way in. So I, I got to at least <laughs> check go. out what's good, you know. <laughs> yeah. I think you can see the way it says a replay on YouTube. I don't know that that's going to... I don't know. I don't know how to work. I don't know how to work. You have, to, work. You have to buy it. Now. I got it. Got it. <laughs> One thing I will mention about this fight. So there was some confusion going into this fight where, you know, on Tapology they had the fight listed at 125. It's at 115. So it's yeah. Belbita moving down. So, I mean, she made weight, but you do have to wonder, is that going to take a lot out of her? And she really just hasn't looked that great in the UFC. I think it's kind of one of those interesting matchups where they want to see where Goldie is after the time off. Remember, she won on Contender Series, and then the UFC didn't sign her because they said she needed more experience and then like two months later they're like oh yeah do you want to fight Miranda Granger sure and then she ended up losing but I think of all people to have a layoff and to have this much time off I think it actually benefited her because she actually had that chance to work on her craft and get a little bit better and she's in Florida I mean there's a lot of cross training going on over there she talked about training with Jillian Robertson I think in terms of camps she's doing a lot better than what Bobita is doing and I know this is a Canadian because Bobita actually trains with Kyle Nelson in uh, in Stony Creek and that's not like an amazing camp and Kyle Nelson loved the guy but 
but he's like a borderline UFC fighter. I don't know what type of push he's getting over there, whereas I think Goldie has the better camp and just has a lot more resources over there in Florida as well. So uh, it is a bit of a risk. I'm glad you guys brought that up in terms of, you know, this is a fight I think, you know, would be good to stay away from. But with all that said, I do like Goldie here because I think, you know, having the time off will actually be beneficial. You mentioned the strength there. I mean, you know, this is, you know, some people might say, well, the fighter moving down would be stronger. I don't know. Goldie, she looks like a bodybuilder. I mean, she's a little, you know, tank, so to speak. So we'll see uh, how she performs uh, in this fight. But I think this is uh, definitely a winnable fight for Hannah Goldie. Yeah, I mean, you see it, Alex, in lower weight classes in wrestling, like the 135 and the 145-pound guy. You'll see, like, a lanky 145-pound guy who's not that strong, but then the 135-pound guy is like a muscle shark, you know? So it's it's not nece- it's necessarily true that the bigger person coming down is going to be stronger, and I agree with you. In the face-off, it looked like Goldie's going to be able to throw her around at will. And I just don't know that Belbita has the sophisticated striking to just, you know, for, for me to be like, oh, yeah, it, it, she's going to be able to outstrike her, especially with that range and that reach. You know, it's not like she's an Israel Adesanya or anything like that. So um, moving up to the third fight, and we can kind of blaze through. I, I don't want to blaze through, but I'm just saying, like, as far as, like, uh, you know, dog with a shot or pass. Um, I'm going to say that Andre Ewell's dog with a shot. I mean, especially if we're going back to athleticism and reach, seeing that face off, he was dwarfing Julio Arce. And, and you know, part of it was his hair was up and maybe that gave him a little bit of a height and created the illusion. But he looked like he had a lot of reach on Julio Arce. He looked like he was going to have superior athleticism. And Andre was just that type of fighter. I mean, let's not pretend we haven't seen this. He's a decision machine. He pumps that jab. He stays on the range. He, he's, he's an aesthetic. He, he does decent volume. And he's, he's aesthetic as far as um, in the judge's eyes, if it goes to the decision, I think he ends up squeaking out two out of three rounds. What do you guys think? Yeah, it's actually a five-inch reach advantage there for Ull, so you're 100% right. Height-wise, uh, Ull's only a little bit taller here. But the other concern with Arce is that he hasn't fought since November of 2019 when he was on that card against, uh, he fought Hakeem Diwadu on that card, which interestingly enough, they're under the same management now, which is kind of interesting. But um, yeah, I do wonder like what's going to happen. Also, uh, I don't know if it was widely reported, but Arce got COVID. That's why he was out of the Valley of Fights. So you do wonder if that's going to have a little bit of an effect on him uh, coming back to the cage here. Um, I-, I think with Ull, it- it's definitely a possibility of him going out there. And like you said, there was that. Uh, fight he had was it Jonathan Martinez the fight that everyone thought that he definitely you know that he, that he should have lost that one so yeah this is another one where I kind of be a little bit hesitant to you know to, to bet on just because of the fact that there are too many you know a lot of because Ull's also not shown up in fights I mean you know as, as much as he squeaked by decisions there's fights as well where he definitely could have performed a lot better so we'll see and I think people also forget that Arce has a win over Dan Ige which looking back now that's actually one of his best wins in his career so he is a guy that could surprise here but um, yeah it, it's going to be a very 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 interesting matchup on Saturday. Yeah, I actually I picked you all, but like you said, James, it's it's very hit or miss, and I'm really picking it from more of like the value standpoint. Last time I checked, he was plus one seventy, um, so I, I feel like these two guys are both within the same uh, you know range caliber of fighter. Uh, Andre Yul, he's going to go into just about every fight with a, a reach advantage, so it's almost it's kind of a wash, right? Because that's that's how it's always going to be. Uh, but as far as the weigh-in, yeah, they both looked pretty good. They looked very comfortable up there on the scale. Didn't look like you know that took too much of a, uh, a sacrifice to actually get down to the weight. So they both look very comfortable. We'll see if the range plays a part, see if you can keep it on the outside with the jab and squeak by with the win. I'm hoping so uh, with the plus 170 dog in this one. Alex, what are your thoughts? You picked Arche, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, yeah? You're muted. Yeah, I did pick him. Um... But uh, the Dan Ige win had a lot of weight in that for me. But, you know, it kind of gives me cause to pause at the same time because Dan Ige isn't the world beater we all thought he was. You know, he lost to Chang Sung Jung and Calvin Cater, who you put a guy like Calvin Cater against Max Holloway, the best guy in the division, it just goes to show, like, how many levels there are to this game. Like, because what would, what would Max Holloway do to Chang Sung Jung? You know, so it, it's it's really tough to say, but I'm I'm going with Julio Arce here, despite the reach disadvantage. But as we always say, a reach disadvantage sometimes is just as much as a, of an advantage if you can close the distance. Yeah, that's going to be his path to victory for sure. Getting on the inside of Mr. Yule. Um, Yule's definitely getting a little bit smarter every time he goes out there, though. It seems like he's really like hitting his stride. I think he could be a mainstay of the bantamweight division if he um, if he can string some wins together. Uh, but next, another dog with a chance, Mickey Gall, guys. I mean, Jordan Williams, that's another person I wanted to look out for on the scale. We know that Jordan Williams has weight issues stemming from a condition called diabetes. Um, you know, close personal childhood friends of mine have had diabetes, and I know how much it can impact things like sleep, things like job performance, things like school performance. 
So diabetes is, you know, it's a chronic condition that's going to impact a lot of different aspects of your lot, your life. And uh, yeah, I just, I was eager to see, you know, how this way and looked because I, I knew that Mickey Gall, a lot of people thought he might have a size disadvantage against Williams. I didn't see it that way. Um, Mickey Gall has fought as low as welterweight before. So seeing him go up to middleweight uh, against Jordan Williams, you know, you, you think maybe as a disadvantage. I thought Gall looked just as athletic, just as tall, just as good of a build. So I'm going with Gall here, guys. I think he turns the ship around. He's training with Mike Brown. Um, he's been training with the Muscle Farm team, I think, like Joe Schilling, Mike Brown. Uh, he's back in Jersey. Um, Matt Brown, sorry, not Mike Brown. What am I saying? Not ATC. Matt Brown. <laughs> um, what do you guys think about this fight? It's actually a welterweight fight. Sorry to cut you off there. Um, oh, yeah, so so right. it's, 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 it's Williams moving down. So he uh, he's right. coming down from uh, some middleweight. A couple uh, yeah, interesting things, because I actually had a chance to speak to both guys. So Williams, I don't know if you guys heard, moved his entire camp up to Colorado. He's been training at Factory X for uh, a couple months now. So I think that's a good fit for him. It's cardio. That's something to keep in mind in this fight with being at, at training at elevation. Uh, you know, a lot better training partners than who he's training with back in California. So I think that's definitely an advantage. I saw him on the scales today. He looked fine. Don't think it's going to be an issue with him there. I'm with you guys, though. I like Mickey Gall in this fight. I think this is a situation where people are sort of overlooking him, but not necessarily looking at the level of competition he's fought in, in that entire process. And remember, this is a guy that was kind of rushed to the UFC, uh, you know, won that looking for a fight show and then was sort of just, you know, having to learn on the job similar to like a Chase Hooper. And uh, I know for this camp, Gall uh, had a chance to speak to him this week. He did uh, stay basically uh, close to home base, although he did go down to Ohio and train with Matt Brown. So not in California uh, where that muscle farm thing was there. I think that's actually disbanded because I know Schilling, I believe now is training with Juan Archuleta and those guys over there. So uh, I do know that Gall went and trained in Ohio with Matt Brown. So he did get some work in with him as well. Um, I think this is a great opportunity for him to go out there and really remind people that he is a talented kid and he's still get you know he's still getting up there in age. I think with Williams, one of the things I look at is just that you know he tends to have trouble when guys are pressuring him, and I think that's what Gall's going to do in this fight. I think there's a sense of urgency with Gall as well, knowing that you know he's got to live up. I mean, uh, to, to sort of the expectations that people had, and he hasn't really lived up to that. So I, I see him going out there and putting on a really good performance performance against uh, Jordan Williams and what it really comes down to is a couple things level of competition and also the fact that Gall's been a mainstay at 170 I don't know how Williams is going to look even with the new camp and moving down a weight class I think Gall uh, potentially could pull this one off by decision so I like him as an underdog in this fight yeah I think you're dead on as far as uh, the stylistic advantage that Gall might have as far as being the pressure fighter and uh, Williams's history of not typically dealing with that so well um, I'll have to take a look back at the weigh but to be honest I don't feel like either guy looked amazing on the scales, uh, Williams in particular. Um, it seemed like there was a moment at the end there where they called out 170 and he had the look of like, oh, thank God I made it. And then kind of, you know, just wobbled off the stage there. Uh, again, I'll have to look at it one more time, but it just it seemed like it, it might have been a tough uh, weight cut, even for both guys. I wasn't too throw, um, enthralled with Mickey Gall uh, coming off the scales there. But, you know, we'll see. Again, an another good dog play, in my opinion. So, Alex, who did you have in this one? Do you have Mickey Gall? No freaking shot, dude. <laughs> the, the guy, the guy's only claim to fame is beating up a journalist and a, a 42 year old who still walks around calling himself a punk. So <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, he doesn't really have many real wins in the UFC and it only took him one fight to get in the UFC. Danny, how many fights did the guy who he beat up to get in the UFC have? Zero. His only fight is against Mickey Gall. So, I mean, all you had to do was beat up somebody and call out a 42-year-old who calls himself a punk. It's ridiculous. I, I don't necessarily think he's all that good. And, um, you know, if he's – like Luke said, Luke said he's training with Joe Schilling. That's a reason to bet on him. I mean, I, if he's getting drunk at Applebee's and knocking people dead there, then, um, you know, I, that gives me way less of a reason to bet on him in my opinion. Even if he's at Red Lobster, which is, you know, a little bit higher class than Applebee's. But, you know, I, I don't know, man. Like, I, I can't even take this seriously because Sage Northcutt is not the guy we thought he was. CM Punk is nothing. And Mike Jackson, besides the king of pop, did nothing. We understand. But, like, I, I'm more inclined to agree with James on this one because, like he said, you know, Mickey Gall's he's not the youngest guy on the roster for sure. I mean, but he's – He's kind of gone through trial by fire. He's learned on the job a lot, and he's with the right people. Like when I said he was with uh, Matt Brown from the Muscle Farm thing, I think I, what I was trying to say was he was he, he's, he went out to Ohio with Matt Brown, but he didn't just start with Matt Brown. He's been with guys who are veterans and 
grizzled veterans at that, like Matt Brown and Joe Schilling, for a while. So I think that Mickey Gall just kind of needed to get a little bit of a rind on him. You know what I mean? He needed to get a little bit of a rind. And now he's got that rind. And I just think Jordan Williams, I mean, I, Mickey Gall's got more tools to win here. So let's just move along. Ian Hines. I mean, Romy beat Robocop, and he had a unanimous decision loss against Amabov. So, like, at least he's fighting real fighters. That's that's all I'm saying. For sure. No, for sure. And I have a lot of respect for Robocop. And uh, I, I just think, I guess, you know, Mickey Gall is definitely in a must-win situation for himself. We always say the hungry dog runs the fastest. Um, and I think that you're right. I mean, Mickey Gall has been the much less impressive fighter, but that's why we get him at underdog odds here. That's why we get him an underdog odds, because he lost to Diego Sanchez. I mean, let's be real. Um, all right, so moving along, though, this next fight, Ian Heinsch versus Nazardine Imavov and Huna, Huna Hile Soriano versus Brendan Allen. I want to say the same thing about Heinsch as I want to say about Soriano. So just everything I say about Heinsch, take into account for Soriano, too. These guys are built in the weirdest way I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it go, their bodies go up in a perfect V. They have, like, fins hanging off of their side. It's like... It's like an extra rib cage almost. It's insane. I mean, I, I've never seen anything like it. So that tells me that their muscles are, you know, more so built for show. Both of their opponents are the type, type of guys whose muscles are built for go. You know what I'm saying? Like they have that lean kind of physique, that uh, physique of, you know, functional strength Brendan Allen does. Uh, same with same with Imavov. I just think Brendan Allen and Imavov are so much more polished than both of their opponents. To get them both as dogs – after Mickey Gall is a dog, after Andre Yule is a dog. I mean, after Hannah Goldie is a dog, I think, even. I'm just thinking this is a dog. It's raining dogs on this card. So I love Brandon Allen. I love the mob off. I'd like, like to get your guys' take on these two fights. But to me, the weigh-ins, the story is the same here in, in the weigh-ins if you're going to give them both an eyeball against their opponents. I'll, I'll keep it. I'll keep. I'll keep it short uh, for, for for mine. I, I kind of half agree with you there. Um, I do like. Um, I do like Brendan Allen against uh, Puna Soriano. Puna. I don't know if people have kind of been paying attention. He's hardly fought over the last couple of years because of concussion issues. He's had a lot of injuries, so he's going to be fighting a guy in Brendan Allen who just not only has a lot more experience but fought way better competition. Uh, Allen, even prior to him getting into the UFC, you know, fought guys like Trevin Giles and Eric Anders and Anthony Hernandez on the regional scene before even making the UFC. So he's been very much battle tested. Brendan's also really situating very well at Sanford MMA. He switched up camps uh, leaving Rufus Sport and he's over there now, which that camp, I don't know if you looked at some of the names uh, that are training over there. I think that's a perfect fit for him in this fight. To me, Puna's got a puncher's chance. He can definitely hit like a truck but the thing is, Brendan Allen, I think, has seen uh, you know fighters with that type of power before and I think if he doesn't get him out early, I think Brendan could you know take advantage and also the ground game definitely favors Brendan Allen as well. Remember when he fought Kevin Holland, was losing that first round, was getting outstruck, was able to come back in the second to get the submission here. So I like Brendan Allen in that fight. As far as Heinish and even off. That's a really close fight. Heinish is another guy, believe it or not, that is over at Sanford MMA. He finally has a camp. The last two fights, he's been kind of this nomad. He was actually living in an RV when he was training at Genesis because he didn't have a house yet. He's now bought a house. He's married. He's finally settled into his roots at uh, Sanford MMA. And also, he trains with a guy that beat Imabov in Phil Hawes. So that was one of the things I asked him in the interview. Is that something that you know the coaches are already familiar with the opponent? So I think that's going to play an advantage as well. So I like Heinish in this fight. I think now that he's kind of got everything settled because he had a I don't I don't know what happened, but he had a obviously a split from Factory X. He was there for a long time. I think now that he's finally situated in a new camp, a camp, by the way, that's found a lot of success this year, I like uh, Heinish to pull off a decision this one. I think uh, overall, he's going to put a, put a really good performance out on Saturday. Yeah, I love Ian Heinish and I love betting on him. And I wanted to take him even against Gastelum, who is obviously one of the most highly touted opponents he's faced. So, and I did take him against Gastelum. But, um, and, and you know what? To be honest, what the weakness he showed in the Gastelum fight, I don't believe will uh, appear as threats from Imabov. I mean, I think that Imabov brings a whole different style. And the fact that, you know, he does train with Phil Halls, who followed Imabov, is great. But Imabov, Imabov had Phil Halls on skates in that third round. I mean, I kind of scored that a draw. I scored that 10-8 in the third round, first two rounds of Halls, make it a draw. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I think that overall going to Sanford will help, will help Heinsch, but it's going to maybe take a little bit longer. I think that maybe... Uh, and Malvov can still get the jump on him in the striking department if if Heinz can't get the fight to the ground or at least pose the threat of the takedown. But I think if they go strike for strike, Amalov knocks him out because he's a sniper. And I think Heinz just moves in that kind of Paulo Costa way to Amalov's Israel at the way. You know what I mean? Like just a little bit too blocky, a little bit too muscly. Dan, Alex, any thoughts? I mean, Henry Hooft is a wizard and uh, one of my favorite coaches in all of MMA. 
Um, now, I mean, I didn't even know that both of these men went to Sanford MMA. That makes me so much more confident. I think we're going to see a much more polished Ian Heinish in that case. And Luke, the muscles aren't for show. It's just when you're in prison, all you can do is work out. So that's yeah. all Ian Heinish was doing. He was doing push-ups, sit-ups all day long. That's why he has those shark fins. And I, I agree with uh, James over here. I think that Ian Heinish wins this fight, and I also think Brendan Allen's does. All right. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely – Heinish is definitely one of my more timid bets. Like, I'm, me taking a mob off, I feel like a dirty boy doing that. You know what I mean? I feel like I'm, I feel like, I'm like, really an outsider doing this because no one else is really every, – everybody looks at this as – Heinish rebound fight. Heinish is rebound fight. But I look at it as he was already at his Super Bowl in getting that Gastelum fight. He lost it. This is his Super Bowl hangover fight. This is his big step down in name value, but the, it's a step up in competition. It's a step up in competition from Gastelum. Let's be honest. We got, where Gastelum's at in his career right now, the Mavos a step up. So, in my opinion. but it, It's that, debatable. I mean, he's fight, Gastelum's fighting Jared Cannon here right now for a reason, I think. I mean, he's headlining that card. It, I, I, I'm like, maybe Imavov, maybe we're all wrong, or maybe I'm wrong here, and maybe he is as good as you say he is, but I don't know if he's on that level yet. This is also a guy that nearly finished Israel out of Sanya and gave him his toughest test to date, other than obviously the Blakovich loss, at middleweight. Uh, so, so keep that in mind as well, too. Very true. Very mm -hmm. true. Just saying, just saying, that's all. I like it. I'm really looking forward to this fight, you know, because I got Luke and James in my mind here as far as how it plays out. Um, I'll, I'll just briefly touch on on the weigh-ins just to round this one off. Heinrich looked really good to me and his demeanor and like the, just the intensity that he had going into the face-off. I really showed something to me uh, for whatever it's worth. And also, I think it's important to note that Brendan Allen was the last fighter to weigh in. There was yeah. a little bit of a gap between the second to last fighter weighing in and, uh, and himself. Um, I don't think he looked too, too bad on the scale. I mean, sometimes when we're looking at this thing, it's like we're really pulling hairs. But um, at the same time, I pick Soriano, but it's, I mean, it's based on a puncher's chance, right? So uh, Allen definitely has the skills pretty much everywhere else besides the power um, to really probably get the W, to be honest. But I guess I'm betting on the fact that this is one of those, you know, three out of ten times where Soriano will land that, that one left hand that will end the night for him. So uh, we'll see. There are going to be great fights, though, I'll tell you that. Yes, sir. Well, we have just a few more fights left to break down. One, two, three, four, five fights left on the main card to get to. This is the main card breakdown that is about to begin. James, we're at the 30-minute mark. If you have another interview to get to or anything else scheduled, you are free to go, my man. I know we only a lot of you for a certain amount of time, so just wanted to give you that out. If you want to just give us your thoughts on the main event and dip, you can. Otherwise, we'll just take this main card away. I'll, I'll, I'll do you one better. I'll, I'll do sort of quick. Uh, I'll give you my quick little notes on these last couple of fights because, you know, I, I, I interviewed, I don't know how many people on this card. I think 13 total or something. It's crazy. So, uh, Giannis and Costa, super, super, super competitive fight. I think what it's going to come down to is the level of competition and the experience for Giannis. This is a guy that has proved himself time and time again on the regional scene, gets this shot. And I think they're very similar fighters, to be honest. Both have really good power. Both are going to stand in trade. I give a slight edge to Giannis. I'm going with the odds on this one. Macy, Barber, Miranda, Maverick. Guys, this is a fight that UFC by my vantage point, looks like they want to get rid of Macy Barber. Why would you build up a 22-year-old, say she's going to be the youngest champion, all this stuff, loses a fight to Roxanne where she ends up hurting herself and you give her Alexa Grasso on her return fight in a co-main event? What are you doing? It seems to me there it was like, okay, Macy, if you're as good as you say you are, you better beat Grasso. She didn't. Loses badly. Macy then is coming back and fighting the prospect killer, Miranda Maverick, who, by the way, is a prospect herself, but remember she fought Jillian Robertson? They're just trying to feed off, uh, get rid of prospect prospects and get Miranda Maverick to take them all out. Barbara also switching camps again. That's been five camp switch-ups to my count. She's now at Team Alpha Male, so I don't know if that's going to help, but we'll see. Uh, I think Maverick takes this one, but it just you know, it, just by the matchmaking here, it looks like the UFC is trying to get rid of Macy Barber. I've stuck with that conspiracy theory all week. I'm going to stick with it here. Darren Elkins, Derek Minner, very close fight. If the old Elkins show up, I think he can win, but I think that old Elkins is gone. The damaged Elkins, so to speak. Derek Minner catching him at a good time. A lot of experience here between the two fighters. I like Minner by decision in this one. Co-main event, I'll keep it short. Kyler Phillips, mainstay bantamweight. He's not a guy moving up like his opponent is. Paiva's had uh, some glimpses of good stuff, but Phillips is on a roll right now in the prime of his career. Phillips takes this one either by knockout or decision. And main event, Corey Sanhagen, I like him a lot here. I don't know how people are so confident in a guy who's been off for so long, had some major injuries, um, is 35. Like, he's not Dominic Cruz. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I think right now your safer bet is to go with Sanhagen here because he's fought more often. He's made some key adjustments since losing to Aljamain Sterling. I think, and, and not only that, height and reach advantage in this fight as well. So I like Sanhagen in this one. 
It's going to be interesting. Can TJ turn back the clock here? There's so much pressure on him to, to, to perform here because if Dillashaw loses, that's it for him, I think, as a contender at his age and how deep that division is. With Sanhagen, yeah, he's already lost to Sterling, but a loss here is not going to be detrimental. He's still under 30. I think there's a lot of room for improvement here. The pressure's on Dillashaw. Give me Corey Sanhagen by decision or late finish. I think he gets it done. Hopefully that answered uh, all the fights there for you guys. <laughs> Wonderful, James. Thank you so much. Yeah, I just wanted to get a synopsis on this, especially the main event, because everything I'm hearing from everybody is, you know, Dillashaw is coming off a two-year layoff, so you've got to give Sanhagen every advantage in terms of strength of schedule activity. Um, you got to give Sanhagen the height and reach advantage. you got to give Sanhagen the age advantage. You give Sanhagen every single advantage, then you hear, oh, Sanhagen used to get the better of Dillashaw in training. And then you hear all these different things, and, and then you hear, oh, and, and not only that, but Dillashaw is going to have a double peak, essentially, because he had to cut and had to rebook the fight and had to peak twice for this, essentially. So it's like every metric, every piece of evidence is in Sanhagen's favor, but yet these two guys on the show are going to pick Dillashaw. I don't, under, I don't understand. I'm going with Sanhagen. I'm riding with you, James. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Uh, we'll let you get out of here if, uh, if, if you have to go. Um, we'll probably stick around and break down the rest of the card in a little bit more detail. But always a pleasure to have you, James. Thank you so much. Thanks, James. Appreciate it. I, I do got to go. Always appreciate you guys having me on. Anytime you know where to find me, at Lynch on Sports, easiest way to find me because uh, I work for so many different outlets. And thanks again, guys. Have a great weekend and enjoy the fights. You too. Me too. All right. That was James. I wasn't here for the last episode he was on, right? No. You were not. You were not. You were uh, down bad then too. <laughs> <laughs> great to finally meet him. Great to finally meet the man. The myth. Yes, I have smoked the crack cocaine. <laughs> yes, I've made mis- I've made mistakes. I, all I can do now is apologize and move on. I don't know what. I'll, oh, guys! Oh, 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 okay. Can I? Can I just? Yeah, go ahead. All I can say is I've made mistakes. Is that the mayor of Toronto? Rest in peace, Rob Ford. Another Canadian, just like James Lynch, had to get a Canadian get get some drops. So yeah, well, James just demystified the main card for you guys from his perspective. We're about to take you through the main card, give you a little demystification ourselves. I'm going to demystify the Brajoli steak. <laughs> ah, Frank the Tank, let's go. And I met Barstool Smitty last night. Great guy. We played a lot of blackjack together. Both both made heaps of money, so it was a great night. <laughs> Yeah, dude. I, we got a lot of Barstool people in our circle, it seems, in our, in our satellite sphere. I get texts all the time from people that are like, oh, I met a guy from Barstool. I showed him your podcast. And I'm always like... Uh, I honestly don't even know who those people are. And please don't ask me any dumb questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, and by the way, by the way, by the way, by the way, by the way Yes, Alex, I swear to God, I, did, I didn't even know who that guy who said the Bajoli steak thing was. I just found it in like some kind of compilation, and I was just making drops for the show. And the fact that you even know it, it's so funny. Right the tank. I got a nice little stick of butter here that I'm frying up. <laughs> he's the biggest Mets fan of all time. He's he's so down bad about the Mets, even when they're in first place and hitting yeah. fingers every game. But – yeah, I mean, and by the way, guys, like that might have been a dumb question that I asked him if he's going to fight Tyron Woodley, who he's fighting. I guess that's dumb, and he doesn't know who he is. But you know, whatever. I mean, I'm not. I'm- I honestly don't even know who those people are. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Some would say I'm a great journalist. Oh Some. man, Some. you got you bad. You got you bad. I got a lot of uh, drops. This is what it is, and I can't change the past. And. <laughs> You might as well play the whole interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, I I, I got to kind of, it's funny because like, you'll notice I'm going to have to start guiding the conversation towards my drops. I can, <laughs> yeah. I can feel it. I can feel it. <laughs> like, for example, last week, Alex, you know, he was able to win $500, um, which is... <laughs> so yeah, you won 500. This week we're hoping to win 500 more when the snake devours, uh, or the the, yep, the, snake, the, mongoose, the snake. mongoose devours the serpents or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> all right, so, yeah, there was a lot more I wanted to get to with James Lynch. I'll be honest, guys. It seemed like the connection when we had four people on was a little bit less stable. I was trying to use the drops while he was here and do different things, but every time I did, I noticed that it was kind of lagging a little bit. I don't know if it's going to show up that way on the YouTube. We'll have to figure this out. I'm going to get. 
some hard line in here, guys. I'm gonna have to get some hard lines so we can get a stable connection. Um, get, get off that Walmart Wi-Fi, bro. I know, I know. It's not like Zoom. There's re- <laughs> hey, we talked a lot of shit on Zoom, but Zoom didn't lag as much as Streamyard does. I'll tell you that much. All right, so let's just break down this main card real quick because we we are gonna get into some fights that I think I might want to change my mind on just a little bit. So I picked Yanez, but I'm all in on Costa at this point, man. He looked really, really, really good. And I just think he might be the more mature fighter, the more sophisticated fighter. Um, and he just might be in there, I think, embracing the spotlight, embracing the moment, fight smarter, fight, get the win. Um, then we got Macy Barber. Well, I'll let you guys talk about that fight first. So go ahead. I mean, how is he a more, more mature fighter when he has less experience and, uh, like, le- less quality of opponent? On, like on no front is he a more like like that does it that makes no sense Luke. he just looks like a well put together guy he no, looks no. Like he was, his he media presence his media presence seemed like he was more on the ball like a little bit sharper in interviews things like that like i'm just saying he just like he seemed more like sentient of like the surroundings whereas yanez seems a little bit bubbled like a little like you know and maybe that's good for a fighter sometimes you know i'm maybe i'm getting sold by propaganda here but i'm just saying I see Randy Costa, he's like doing messages on his Instagram story. And maybe it's also because I actually followed him on Instagram after the Fuck, Mary Kill segment we did last week. I followed him. I'll admit that. I'll admit that. I did that. I followed him. Okay? And I reached out. So, um, anyway. So, but, so- but, you know, it is odd that neither of these two men have an OnlyFans. Like, if Hannah Goldie's making money on this shit, like, uh, like Randy Costa is way hotter than Hannah Goldie. Wrong. You're Wrong. crazy. You're crazy. Zohan is an absolute <laughs> stud, dude. Yeah, Zohan, is a, Zohan is a guy I would be proud to date. Just to I'm going him. to make my girlfriend leave the room when he's fighting. Like, I don't <laughs> yeah. want her to see that men are built like that. I know. Uh, anyway, so what do you think, Dan? You're still going to go with Yanez? Am I going to untriple you certify Yanez? You know what? I think I might change some picks around, and I'll I'll put those in the Discord, or I'll even tell you on here. I don't know why I'm keeping it secret on the Discord, but I'm gonna hold hold put with that particular one. I'm keeping Yanez. Um, I just think he's he's the future man of the bantamweight division. He's got crazy knockout power, and I think he fights a, a smart fight. So you know, just with everything being said, it's gonna be a close fight. I'm probably gonna sweat through it, but you know, Yanez is the pick for sure. Well, Costa did the he, – he opened up a fake can, an imaginary can of Dr. Pepper and poured it on the ground. Why? Because they're, they're, doing, they're doing like a war thing. Like basically like Yanez is representing um, the side of Dr. Pepper and Costa is representing the side of Reese's Pieces. What, that sounds what is the difference super lame. between the two <laughs> things? They're both delicious. Exactly. My thing is, A, what, have you guys never been to a movie? You can have both. <laughs> I mean, they're not even in the same category. Yeah. <laughs> one's a food, one's a drink. I, I don't get it, to be honest. And it's like one has like 20, 23 flavors, right? 23? Yeah. If you're lucky, 20, you get one with a cherry, Dr. Pepper. Now that one's going to have a 24th one. 24th. And if you get the cherry vanilla, cherry Dr. vanilla. Pepper, 25, baby. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> now you get one more flavor in there. You got a full alphabet, 26 flavors. So I'm not going to go full A to C on them. Here's the problem, though, Luke. I did the research on this, and DC was wrong because cherry is already a flavor inside. They just put more in there. Interesting, interesting. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's one well, of 23 original flavors. Well, speaking of the future, Dan, I know you said that like four paragraphs ago, but um, you said <laughs> <laughs> you did say the future. Macy Barber segue the future. Macy the future Barber. I disagree with James Lynch. I mean, I see this fight as Macy's comeback fight. But I get what he's saying, that they might want to get rid of her. Maybe they want to get rid of her because, you know, she's one of those prodigies that was brought on by veterans of the game a little quickly. Like, for example, she was working with Ben Askren, right? Ben Askren, notable guy to get into contract disputes with Dana White. So maybe he's giving her bad advice. Maybe he's telling her, you know, hey, ask for more money. Ask for this. You're the future. You're the barber, whatever you are. You're the hairstylist. Get her in there with and, – and then all of a sudden – She's having bad negotiations. The UFC is like, man, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that like, so yeah, so maybe that's the case. Maybe James is sniffing a little bit of that, but I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I think Macy Barber is easy to work with. I think she's got a good team spirit and I think she's also, um, you know, I think she's cute too. So how about that? 
I think he's dead on. I think the Maverick is going to roll through her. I think it's going to be an easy fight. Uh, this is a parlay pillar. All Every single one of my parlays, Miranda the Maverick, she's the future. She's the real future. Uh, not Macy. You're gonna, wait, you're going to cement any I'm cementing fighter. her. To cement any female fighter in all parlays is just asking to wake up in the morning and say, why no. did I do that? No, no, absolutely not. I'm very good with the female. I, I want to figure out what my female MMA pick ratio is. I guarantee it's 75 or higher. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, all you have to do is actually keep track of all your bets on a simple Excel spreadsheet. Like I do, lines. I do. I just haven't broken it down by gender now. Like, but anyway, yeah. Miranda this guy's guy so technologically inept, the guys, just to let you know. Like, he, <laughs> he, he can't even fucking manage a group thread in a text. Like, what are you talking if I, if I asked him to rename a group thread in an iPhone text, he would not know how to do it. I don't even know what that means, but at the same time, all I'm doing is keeping track of my picks and giving it to you. I don't know why, why I came to a technological breakdown of my skills. Because, because all you would have to do is like go in an Excel spreadsheet and you can even value your picks as like male, female, and then you could like have it automatically spit out for you your ratio of like correct female picks. Listen, right, Luke, well, I mean, <laughs> now I know, do I do that? No, I don't. But I'm yeah. <laughs> You're losing Dan more jobs saying he doesn't know how to use Expel than you did uh, talking Expel. about school shooters last week. <laughs> you don't even know how to use Expel. Yeah. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, so Dan, it says here on your resume that you are certified in Microsoft Office, but on this podcast, your friend said that you can't use Excel. Which is it, Dan? Is Luke lying there or are you lying now? Uh. <laughs> Get the fuck out of my office. <laughs> Oh my god! Oh jeez! And, and Dan, way to like make make fun of me for a flub when I'm coming to your defense, you shithead! That's like true. that is that, that is so poor, that's though. such poor character. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I hope you don't yeah. get the job now. Yeah, that's something I can Good also job. put on my resume. Something yes. I can put on my resume. Yeah. Terrible character. It's just not a thief. You have guy. you have the best job you guess where you work for Triple P LLC, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Only there's a lot of liability. It is the best. The liability is not limited. The liability is unlimited. <laughs> <laughs> it's an unlimited liability. Uh, okay. Um, let's move on. Macy Barber, I got her. Dan doesn't. He's got Maverick cemented in every one of his parlays. Alex, you're going with Maverick? Double M? Maverick. She's got, she's got the jawline. And you know what, guys? I apologize because <laughs> last week I did say that you guys were saying there, Miranda Maverick. <laughs> Uh, you think she's hot, and I was being mean. And I said she wasn't <laughs> hot because I got a little embarrassed. Okay, I started blushing. I didn't want people to know I thought she was hot. You wanted to tug on her pigtails a little bit. You wanted to tug on yeah, her pigtails. Uh, you know, she's all right. I saw her walk up to the scale. I was like, "Is this Hannah Goldie?" That's that's what I was thinking at first. I was like, "Wow, Hannah Goldie! Like, how did how is she making money on OnlyFans?" And I was like, "Oh wow, no, that is Miranda Maverick. She's a lot more attractive than I thought. I won't give her the status of hot." But I will say she is a lot more attractive than I originally anticipated. So you're still picking fabric for the fight. <laughs> yeah. For the fight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to figure out where your mindset was. But Randy Costa is still the hottest person on the card, man, woman, or child. Well, hey, it's easy to know who the ugliest person on the card is, and that's Darren the Damage Elf. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good back. segue. Good segue. Hey, WMEIMG, can we get this man cast as – a gas station employee on a wayward, almost abandoned, semi-closed gas station stop in some kind of horror movie. I could see him in overalls and a straw hat, chewing on a piece of bull rush, and just going, oh, yeah, yeah, that old mine shaft is haunted, been haunted for years, ever since they shut it. Uh, you know, something something poltergeisty, you know? Get him in there as, like, the guy on the rocking chair. Telling Dude, the even, that, that, even that role... Mark Wahlberg is playing where he had to get fat and he's mad at himself for getting fat and he's still hot. Like he's it's like, like what, uh, yeah, it's walk. like what's up, Mr. Six AM Club? What's up, Mr. Six AM? <laughs> you that? Oh, did you burn out? Because it's fucking annoying to wake up that early every day, isn't it? So much so that you had to be like, just give me anything that I can lose that I can gain 150 pounds for. Give me anything I don't have to fucking wake up at 4 30 in the morning for. I hate the rock. I'm done with the rock. <laughs> no movies with the rock. <laughs> Hey, yeah, yeah, the, the Jungle yeah. Cruise is coming out soon, baby. And if you're not if you're not in the theaters for the Jungle Cruise, I don't know what to tell you. You know, the Rock, Dwayne the Rock Johnson's back. Either you, know, are you fellas changing your picks for this fight? <laughs> no chance. Luke is because he's an idiot. Oh, no, I, I I think that listen, Minner looked really great on the scale. Minner's got the Kraus seal of approval. 
But somebody put it this way. They said Minner barely got by Charles Rosa. They were like, Darren Elkins is not the guy that goes out there and gets submitted in the first round, nor is Darren going to get in bad positions on the ground with Minner at all because he's a good wrestler. Um, I think this is a fight where Darren Elkins can get a win because he wins in underdog situations. Minner's a bit of a one-trick pony. Uh, Minner hasn't been known for great cardio. He's not a three-round fighter. He only went three rounds with Charles Rosa, who kind of sucks. Barely got by. Charles Rosa barely got by the guy who bet on himself. So I think I think that I might be switching formally to Elkins, but I might only throw him in on like one parlay. Um, I still think I'll, I will still – I'm going to do my perfect parlay the way I said it on the podcast. I'm going to make a perfect parlay that has Yanez in it, that has Minner in it, that has all the people I originally went with. So I would never forgive myself if I was to let that go by, if I had actually picked a perfect parlay on the podcast and didn't bet it. That would be unforgivable. So uh, – Unforgivable. So I will do that. But, yeah, so moving on, um, Kyler Phillips. You know, in terms of face-offs, like, Paeva and Phillips, it didn't look like a mismatch by any means. Like, you would think that that uh, Paeva is going to, like, you would think he's fighting a 50-year-old man the way everybody's on Phillips. You know what I mean? Like, you would think that he, his opponent is, like, coming in there with crutches. Like, like I don't even – I mean, because everybody's on Phillips, you know? And he's a big heavy favorite, second biggest favorite on the card, I think. But I think it's pretty I think much he's going to get his hand raised, you know. So you think Phillips is going to win? Yeah, I think Phillips is going to win, but I think it's going to be a fight more like the Yanez Costa fight than it is like going to be a complete domination. Like I don't, I don't see like you know, I don't see any crazy physical advantages necessarily. Dude, yeah, I mean, Pieva is a beast. And yeah, exactly. Let's, like, let's not get it twisted. Um, you know, Zalgus, the guy who came out and messed up your favorite fighter in the world, Jerry Rivera. Jerry. <laughs> Jerry. <laughs> uh, you know, like, I mean, he's he's really good. So it's tough to say, and he's got double the experience that Kyler Phillips has. But I saw Kyler Phillips on the scale, dude. Ooh, I'm sorry, Randy Costa. Move over. Kyler Phillips is my man. That's all I want. Kyler Phillips wins this fight for sure. I mean, it's going to be a close fight. It is a much like the Randy Costa and Yanez fight, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, those are the two closest fights on the card. Dan, do you have somewhere to be? I see you shaking your head and looking up above your laptop like someone's tapping their foot trying to get you out of here or something. What's going no, on? no. Up, up ahead is actually a window. I'm, I'm doing a little people watching. Okay, I could. I, <laughs> I, I, I thought there might be a woman with her purse tapping there? her foot. No, I'm, yeah. I'm saying no because I don't think it's going to be a close fight at all. I think Kyler Phillips is going to destroy him. I don't think Paiva, I mean, I don't think he's a beast. I think he's decent. He's a decent flyweight. Now we're moving up to Bantamweight, a guy that's like actually supposed to be there. I think he's going to roll all over him. That's a ripple I didn't even think of. Has he been fighting at 35? Of PM? Yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a 35 right? Zalgas Paisa can barely get past, you know, Zalgas, who's, again, a decent flyweight. You know? Flyweight. So he's coming up from flyweight. Okay, that is interesting. I, you got to listen to James, man. He's coming with the real insights. I was in the bathroom. And was... We're up here going, oh, yeah, Costa, he's a good-looking guy. I think that adds to my five-star system. James <laughs> 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 like, tell us, like, injuries that aren't even disclosed yet. And you're like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll just listen else another time. <laughs> I'm like, well, Costa's a 10 out of 10, so he gets a star for being a 10. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Main event time, baby. Um, So, yeah, the Mongoose came in looking good. TJ came in looking great. And it's everyone's like, oh, TJ looked phenomenal. It's like he has had two years to get ready. I mean, like, if he wasn't ready by now, like, what are we gonna give him another two years to look two great? Years where he wasn't being drug tested, right? Because he wasn't in any fights. So no, he was, you're still no, you're still drug tested during your suspension. Really? Of course you are. You have to be. Why? Why? Because What's he is getting tested for weed when he was suspended for five years? Like and and you can't just retire. You can't just retire. Um, and well, no. What happened with Diaz was he retired and just stopped telling them where he was and stopped like doing his whereabouts, filling out his whereabouts. So so he had he had like all those strikes in a row, like for every time that they went looking for him and couldn't find him. So then when they wanted him back in the UFC, he had to like everything's negotiable. 
everything was negotiable. You know what I mean? They had to negotiate with him. Like, oh, did you? So you just like forgot all those times, and like you just didn't know it was like a miscommunication. He's like, yeah, that. And they're like, all right. And there was picograms of weed in your system. It wasn't a bunch, you know. Dude, I'm all yeah. So the main event, you know, Chael Sonnen is, did, does amazing breakdowns of all these things. And he was talking about like EPO and how he's used EPO in the past. And he gave a really interesting story about like a wrestling team that had EPO put into their body topically using another agent that helps it absorb through the skin by their coach unbeknownst to them. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Diplo. <laughs> I wish I had that coach. <laughs> he put a little Diplo in their system and it made them, uh, right? Diplo? Yeah, you get a little Diplo, a little Molly, get them loose, get them dancing, and then you, then you give them the EPO. Yeah. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, no, we're kidding. Guys, Google, algorithms. This is a joke. We're kidding. I'm not offering medical advice here. Guys, yeah, I never would. We, we had to do some editing do some videos because they're fucking – Google doesn't understand this is a parody podcast. Like, disclaimer, hello, disclaimer, disclaimer. Okay, so um, that's about it, guys. I mean, we didn't break down this main event whatsoever, but I'm still riding with Sand Hagen. Like I said to James, he has every advantage. I'm switching my pick officially on this podcast, so when I get a perfect parlay and I win it, and at the top of it is Corey Sand Hagen, everyone goes, oh, you, you picked uh, – um, Show on the podcast. I'm switching it now. This is why you have to watch the After the Way and shows, and why you have to hop in on the Discord because this is where you're going to get the last minute changes. And again, I am now riding with Corey Sanhagen, the mongoose. There he is, looking beautiful. And uh, I have, I'm supremely confident now. I've done the additional research. And James Lynch, our esteemed guest, has reassured me. Corey Sanhagen for the pick. So James Lynch also oh, took Sanhagen. Yeah. It might be quadruple peed if you were swayed. Now, all voice of God, I'll tell you from the voice of God perspective, Alex, you know, you Corey have Sanhagen the- is a basketball player. TJ Dillashaw is a wrestler. That's why in my heart, there's just like a part of me that goes, TJ Dillashaw is an alpha. Corey Sanhagen's a nerd. Corey Sanhagen, if this was high school, TJ Dillashaw would shove Corey Sanhagen in the locker. Oh, absolutely. You'd shove him in a locker and then stick some EPO in him unwillingly. So, um, it's not you didn't do it. Uh, but that's a joke, and I don't give medical advice once again. Uh, DJ Dillashaw is going to win this fight. I told you guys uh, a few days ago that I really needed to see the weigh ins on this fight. And I'm not really a weigh ins guy. It usually doesn't change my opinion much. As you can see, I didn't change a single pick on this card unless there's big drama show. Um, but I got to go with Dillashaw here. I think he's going to go out there and get it done. He's looking really good, really good on the scales. He's looking good in the week leading up to the fight. He's claiming that the EPO was just so he could cut weight because he was anemic and a baby and he wanted to cut down to 25 so he can beat up smaller men and got knocked out. But I think he goes out there and he gets it done. He, he was very honest about uh, Corey Sanhagen before he was in the UFC. He said he had some bad rounds against him when he was an amateur, not in the UFC yet. So I think that he uses that and gets ahead of the game. And if you watch Chael recently, he said that, you know, TJ Dillashaw might have a few spies in his camp and he's getting some inside intel on exactly what Corey Sanhagen is going to do. Now, did Uncle Chael make an official pick on this fight? He did, and he picked Dillashaw. And if the Chael oh, moves, oh perfect, perfect. Oh. Now I'm now I'm reassured. Yeah. Look at my switch. <laughs> <laughs> Chael cannot pick a fight to save his life. <laughs> yeah, dude. Well, you know, this, this this is you know he's got obviously got a ride with his uh, friend who's doing the sketchy uh, sketchy supplement. Do you smoke crack cocaine? Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Do you smoke crack cocaine? Exactly. I got a lot of Rob Ford. I love Rob Ford. <laughs> Rest, in Rest in peace, Rob Ford. How is this phony town of Toronto like functioning with their funny money and this guy running around smoking crack? All the time? They were doing better when Rob Ford was in office. <laughs> no, that's see. the craziest part. That's the craziest part. <laughs> We can ask James that, you know, next time he's on the show, what his political stance is on Mayor Rob Ford. Um, he, he will not have anything to do with that question, I guarantee you. <laughs> <laughs> he will sidestep the shit out of that question. <laughs> Dude, I had so much more lined up for James. I'm going to have to get him back on the show. He said, he said anytime. 
So listen, James is a professional. Okay, we can't be talking about feet on the podcast when we have James on. All right, all right? come on. We have a you know, we have I was a guest. more annoyed about him. I was more annoyed about him trashing Mickey Gall, who is not only a New Jerseyan but also has been on the Joe Rogan podcast. So he's one degree removed from Joe Rogan, and Alex is out here, you know, disparaging and burning bridges for no reason. We've already burned Jeremy Stevens. We've already burned half burned Anthony Smith at this point. We've, we've burned so many bridges on this podcast. We have to preserve some bridges, especially the local bridges, like the guy from fucking Jersey. <laughs> I'm not saying he's bad. I'm just saying yeah, he's you didn't say he was bad. <laughs> you said he's I bad. Said he's not he's good. Nothing. I said he's not said good. He's nothing or something. Uh, I don't no, know. I said he's fought no one. That's all I said. He's fought nobody of merit. And that's an honest opinion about Mickey Gall. What do you want me to do? Lie to the people? Lie to the great people listening to our podcast? Is that what you were doing? Yeah. It is. Please, believe me. I would never lie to you people, and I'm going to win you tons of money. So cringe. <laughs> I've never lost. Uh, All right. Um, well, that, I guess, kind of wraps up the podcast for the day. Um, you know, this is the highlight of my day, folks. So I don't even want to go. I don't even want to go. I just want to sit here and keep talking. Anderson Silva is going to fight Logan Paul. That's a topic we can mention. Anderson Silva is going to fight Logan Paul. Who wins, Dan? Not Alex. Who wins, Dan? I want to know who, who Dan thinks is going to win. Well, if you look at the odds, Logan Paul is a minus 200 favorite as of right now. I don't know. If, yeah. I certainly didn't know that. Um, I'm going to go with Logan Paul. I'm going with the young buck. Put out a very impressive performance against the greatest of all time in boxing, not MMA. This is the boxing match. And, uh, hey, even in MMA, I would still take Logan Paul with that Ohio collegiate – oh, he was a collegiate wrestler, but state champion wrestling, okay? Uh, Anderson Silva wouldn't want nothing to do with that, nothing. All right, this isn't 1995. Jiu-Jitsu isn't going to work against a young, hungry wrestling buck, and it's not going to work in boxing either. Give me Logan Paul minus 200. When has Anderson Silva done a lick of Jiu-Jitsu? <laughs> Besides when he choked out Chael or uh, Jeremy Horn. Those are the only two submission he has in reality. Like, he, he's a striker. He's a natural born striker, and he just fought a real boxer. He just fought a real boxer. In and he won real, in Mexico. In, in Mexico, he won a decision, and he clowned him the entire time in classic Anderson Silva fashion. The fact that you think some Ohio bum idiot. Oh! God damn. He can is, get up another washed up 50 year old out of the game. That's what happened. He beat up the washed up 50 year old son, didn't he? Whatever. It was Chavez uh, Jr. So he didn't beat up a has been. He beat up a never was. No, this guy boxed. He he like like I never heard of him. I never heard of him. You don't watch boxing. Who do you fight? You don't, you don't even know his name? Who do you fight? Julio Cesar Chavez, Chavez Jr. Jr. Oh. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Ken Griffey Jr. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's dog or pass. I mean, it's dog or pass for me. Oh, Bitman, this bum, this bill, this bum. You you want to know his boxing record? What is it? Every boxing record is padded. You know that. Fifty-two and six, thirty-four knockouts. He, he fought fifty-two cans Ooh. and six real opponents. You're a bum. You're Logan a bum. only fought two cans. Not <laughs> 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 Mayweather. So by the way. I've been saying for my entire existence as a human being on this planet that I could beat up Floyd Mayweather in a street fight. And Adam will any day. I've said this, you know, I've said this since I was in high school. I've been like, guys, Floyd Mayweather, I'd make him my wife. And they're like, well, they're like, no, Luke, he's like a professional athlete. Like, he's a boxer. You couldn't beat him. I was like, guys, I would double leg him. I was like, I would. And then, I, you know, I got to college. And I started doing more jujitsu. And I was like, yeah, I definitely would whoop Floyd's ass. And now, I mean, you, you guys have seen me now hitting my boxing ball. <laughs> so horrible. And so like, horrible. You know, you're so focused on just shooting your special. Yeah. You're not. You don't and that's a Philly shell. You see that Philly shell? They get that shoulder in there. So my point is, I will put his ass 10 out of 10 times. And especially because he couldn't even get Logan Paul out of there, an untrained amateur. It's like, that proved my fucking point. Did it not? Dude, Logan Paul would put you in a casket, though. Yeah, real, dude. I mean, Logan Paul is more of a shot than Floyd. I'll tell you that much. Logan Paul, one hundred percent. Oh, I agree. I, I mean, agree. You know, there are weight classes for a reason. Logan Paul probably outweighs me by a hundred pounds, but Floyd Mayweather, I outweigh him by at least twenty. How much I, do you I, weigh? One hundred thirteen pounds. 
I don't know. How much does Logan Paul start ass way after that? Either way, if he gets in there and plays Anderson Silva, I think Anderson Silva dances on him. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. He puts yeah. his chin out there, runs away. He puts now, him in the matrix. You know, now, the question is, if it's an exhibition, it's going to look just like the Floyd Mayweather fight. But if it's a – but if it's a – Won't be, because he doesn't have that perfect boxing record. He doesn't give a shit about a legacy. But no, this is a fight that Logan Paul, I think, knows he loses, though, if it's a real boxing fight. Logan Paul has to have somebody in his corner that's telling him, like, look, the Floyd fight, yeah, you have a lot of size on Floyd. You can kind of shell yourself up a little bit. But with a big guy like Anderson Silva, like, you're... Dude, Floyd almost knocked him out. Floyd almost knocked him out. Floyd almost knocked him out. Like, and he weighs... 110 pounds with peanut brittle hands. Yet. And Anderson Silva almost beat Uriah Hall like a, a year ago. Like, yeah. are, are we just going to forget that? Yeah, this is a good fight for Anderson. And I, if you're an Anderson Silva fan, you got to be happy about this because you know this is what the spider wants. You know, mm-hmm. uh, he wants money. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's really, but when you see like Logan Paul fighting Anderson Silva, it's like watching, like, you know, you've already moved on, but it's like watching your ex like move on you know what i mean because it's like you know like you want her to be happy but also or some people don't want to be happy like you know uh but at the same time you want her to die in a plane crash yeah like both of your guys exes i don't want to be happy so (laughs) if either of them are watching i hope that you guys are unhappy in fact (laughs) but you know i i i don't i didn't burn any bridges with myself all my exes they live in texas baby so you guys can that's why i hang my hat in tennessee (laughs) <laughs> that's why I hang my hat in Tennessee. So, all right, guys, I think we've talked your fucking ears off long enough. It's been an hour and ten minutes. Thank you so much for joining some for parlay. Tomorrow we're going to be in the Discord. Tomorrow we're going to be chatting with you guys the whole fight. It's one of those sleepy cards taking place 4 p.m. Eastern time prelim, 7 p.m. Yeah. Eastern time main event. So we'll be chilling. Wait, what time do the fights start? Four. four. And seven. Sucks. Oh my god. Why does it what? suck? I am trying to sleep later. Do it later. I stay up late. Yeah. Well, it'll be it'll it'll be you know I can't four be thirty drunk. by the time the first prelim starts. It'll be four thirty, and then you know, that'll be one prelims. o'clock, Luke. I can't be wasted at three o'clock. You know, <laughs> be, I, be I wasted an hour before the first fight. <laughs> yeah, you gotta get a little. You know, you gotta little, get a little a little uh, a little razzle dazzle going. You know, if there's five fights starting at seven, you figure it goes till ten at the latest with all the post fight stuff. So I mean, you know, that's not that bad. Ten o'clock. Get a whole night ahead of you if you want. So anyway, you can chat with us on the Discord. I'll be there all, all day. Uh, I'm going to post all my official plays, all my official bets. I'm heading over to Hoboken to make that happen. So if you're a hater and you want to get um, crushed, you know what I mean, just come to the Hoboken bus terminal in the next hour. Um, as soon as this video finishes processing, meet me at the bus terminal. And uh, that's where I'll be. So um, we're going to get uh, our bets in. We're going to get in place in the Discord. Follow me on Instagram, at PVP Certified. Follow our Twitter, please. It's embarrassing. We just made the Twitter. We need people following our Twitter. So, at PVP Certified, that's going to be the Twitter. Follow us there. I'm trying to build it up. So, um, go follow James Lynch, at Lynch on Sports. But he doesn't really need it as bad as we do. So, if you're here from James Lynch, <laughs> follow us and subscribe and like and do all those good things. And Alex is on Instagram, too, at the same name that you see right there, Euro Wonder King. And, uh, yeah, give us some comments. Everything helps. The likes, the comments, we will answer every single comment. We will talk to you in the Discord. You're our babies, and we're your papa bird. So just open those mouths and let us spit the parlays right in there. We'll all- <laughs> Last week we went 8 out of 10, 9 out of 10, 7 out of 10. We crushed it and won money for everybody in our, in our circle. So thank you guys very much. Enjoy the podcast as always. And um, love you guys. We're out. That was close.